welcome to the Anxious Love Coach Podcast, a place for creating meaningful, conscious, secure, long-term partnerships. Here, we talk relationship anxiety and creating healthy, magnetic dynamics within partnership to help you feel confident and alive within committed partnership. My name is Natalie Kennedy, and I'm your host. I'm a relationship anxiety coach and meditation teacher. I've worked with hundreds of clients battling anxiety, and after experiencing extraordinary shifts in my own healing relative to partnership, now combine my lived personal experience and professional training to help others trust themselves within relationship and in their lives. I've been to the edge and back with my now husband from relationship anxiety and come out confidently to the other side. I want to pass the tools I've learned along to you to help you trust yourself in relationships and also create magnetic, hot dynamics with your partner. I believe lots of mainstream relationship advice today can make us anxious and dissatisfied. So let's jump in and normalize challenges that modern relationships and real people go through while also giving you tools to trust yourself drop the shame, and alchemize your messy, twisted relational truths into profound inner wisdom and aliveness. If you haven't yet, be sure to join my communities over on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Anxious Love Coach. You can also request a 30-minute relationship anxiety assessment with me depending on availability, or ask me a question over on my website at www.anxiouslovecoach.com. I've also got a wonderful relationship anxiety meditation available to you as thanks for subscribing to my email list. Thanks for being here and enjoy this episode. Hello, my dear friends. Welcome back to the Anxious Love Coach podcast. So nice to be back from honeymoon and recording this for you now. I'm really glad to be back. And when I say back, I I am actually recording this from Preston's parents' condo, which they bought recently in Bangkok, Thailand. We are here because we finished our honeymoon in Australia, which was a month long, super nice. And we have two retreats coming up in Austria in June and September, and we were trying to figure out where are we going to spend two months in between honeymoon and the retreats. We're going to come back to the States, so we figured, you know, no, let's let's go hang out in Thailand. It's not quite on the way, but it's kind of on the way. So that's where we're at. I'm recording from this little sauna of a bedroom. It's not actually a sauna. We do have AC, but if I had it on, you would hear it. So I love you too much to have AC running noisily in the background, which my super sensitive microphone would pick up. So I love you so much that I will record this in a, in practically a sauna because Bangkok is very hot. Oh my God. (sighs) All right. For today, I want to talk about how the pressure to have an amazing honeymoon or vacation can ruin your honeymoon or (laughs) vacation. So if I, I wanted to add that disclaimer of vacation, because some of you might not necessarily want to get married, maybe, you know, I don't want to make the assumption that just because you listen to my podcast and are in a relationship that you want to get married. It's not a requirement. Personally, I love marriage. I love the institution of it. Um, Are there drawbacks? Yes, every relational situation has drawbacks, but this is the one that I choose, and I love being married. So if you are not interested in marriage, my guess is you still might, in partnership, want to take vacations. And so wherever I use the word honeymoon, you can replace the word vacation and, and still apply it to you. But I really want to talk about how the pressure to have an incredible vacation or honeymoon can ruin your vacation or honeymoon. Not to say that is what happened to me, although we could argue in either way (laughs) that my honeymoon was simultaneously amazing and a little bit of a shit show. (laughs) And not to say that I would change anything because I really love my work, and every time there's a challenge in my partnership, I kind of imagine using it as fodder for the podcast or for future content. I learned so, so much. And in a nutshell, if you just want to skip everything in the podcast today, what I want to say happens on vacations is we're often trying to retreat out of our day-to-day lives. And when we do that, we're often looking to step out of the ordinary, mundane routine of our lives and go into a sort of extraordinary experience. We want to do something we don't normally do. And so with that comes the quest for the extraordinary. The thing about the quest for the extraordinary, which makes sense because humans want to gradually improve their lives, right? It seems seems logical to want to gradually improve your life by making adjustments. 
And so to whisk yourself out of uncomfortable feelings like boredom and monotony and maybe even anxieties that come up, although that's another topic for another day because it's connected to a whole lot of factors. But with the quest for the extraordinary, let's say you get it. Let's say you let's say you achieve <laughs> the extraordinary. And I hope that you continue to see me as relatable, even as abundance, you know, the, I, I don't know how this happened. Thank you so much. But the success of Anxious Love Coach has allowed me some luxuries that I never anticipated. So I'm simultaneously so grateful. And I'm doing my best to continue to stay relatable. We had arguably a trap of luxury come up, not to a ultra luxurious level. Like I've definitely seen people who have far more than we do. And it's debatable whether I want to get to that point, but I really appreciate where we've gotten. So what I want to say is that, you know, no matter where you are on the scale of financial abundance or whatnot, and we do need to take that into consideration when we're having this conversation, no matter where you are, there's always going to be someone who has a life that's more extraordinary than you. And for some reason, humanity has decided that more extraordinary is, is better. So if you have something, but someone else has something more extraordinary than you, you assume that like, duh, you should go pursue that more extraordinary thing. Why wouldn't you? Well, there's a bit of a trap in there because whenever you acquire something that's more, ex more perceivedly extraordinary, what was once extraordinary over time, if you continue doing it, that becomes ordinary to you. And what was once ordinary to you now becomes a low. And so on honeymoon, that's actually what happens. Press and I had the luxury of time and we don't have kids yet. And we have a lot of time freedom where, you know, my business is completely virtual. So we were thinking, oh my God, we've always wanted to go to Australia. We want to go see the birds. Wow. What if we could go there for a month? You know, we, we really could have gone there for two weeks, but we thought, wow, a month would be so incredible because, you know, a lot of people, they take honeymoon for 10 days. Well, we could go for a month. Some people go for six months. For us, a month seemed luxurious and wonderful. A month seemed like better than two weeks. You know, the irony is looking back on it, I wish we had taken a two-week vacation because it's a lot of pressure to make a whole month <laughs> of experiences extraordinary. And by the end of it, we were so starved for monotony and a routine. And when you're on, when you're constantly doing something every day, trying to maximize your month of of retreat or your month of vacation, you're constantly searching for, for the next high because you don't want your honeymoon to be ordinary, right? That's the whole point. You're stepping out of your life and doing something you don't normally do. But there was a trap in it. So I guess for this episode, I just want to illustrate just another example of how our standards of things, especially in partnership, but also in our getaways and, and the things that we want to acquire and kind of our finances and what we want to achieve in the world. It's weird because the more we want, the more we are sitting in our wanting, it's, it's not to say that desires are bad, but the more we're sitting in our wanting, a wanting of more money, a wanting of more things, a wanting of more consciousness, a wanting of more intimacy, a wanting of more, of more sexual variety, the more there is wanting, the more there is kind of a competition for these things. And where there's more competition, there's more wanting. And it becomes this whew, very fast paced race. <laughs> rat race in society, society for more, 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 more. I want to visit a quote that I saw. Um, I forget if she's a, I think she was a therapist turned coach, um, but she's one of my favorite people that I follow on Instagram named Sylvie Kukasian. If you want to look her up, it's S-I-L-V-Y Kukasian, K-H-O-U-C-A-S-I-N. She's married to a brilliant men's coach. I think they're married anyway, Brian Reeves. So I follow both of them, but she mention something about this. I'm going to read her quote. As the personal transformation industry continues to grow, it seems so does the desire for a more conscious partner, a partner who can meet all our needs, a partner who is self-aware, a partner who is doing quote unquote the work, holding ourselves and others to a more elevated and conscious standard is a truly beautiful thing and it has good intentions. However, I think it's equally important to acknowledge the sometimes extreme and often unattainable pressure that can come with it. All right, so this is 
more so about, you know, having desiring a more conscious partner that will meet you in all the places that you want to be met. But I think it just mirrors this desire for more and more and more and more and more. And as Sylvie said, it's not that it's a bad thing. It does seem to be a natural progression of where he, mankind's thinking is going. And I also think that it's a trap and we're not seeing that it's a trap. So when I was designing my honeymoon, we were thinking a month is better because we can. Traveling for longer is better because we can. Let's think about other things. Working remotely, it's better because we can. Artificial intelligence is better because we can. <laughs> the freedom of choice, the ability to do these things, these extraordinary things that we couldn't do before, it we often don't really comprehend the extent of the consequences of these decisions. More is not better. Sometimes more evolved is not better. Sometimes actually um, these evolutions, they actually create more suffering. It's, we have these new, more complicated problems. And so I don't know if the answer is necessarily to devolve back into the hunter-gatherer forager days. I'm reading a book called Sapiens, um, A Brief History of Mankind. So this is very much on my mind at the moment. Like I'm thinking about my hunter-gatherer days. Blew my, blew my mind. Totally awesome book. Might do a whole podcast on, on this book and how I think it relates to anxiety. But for now, I just want to say that humans assume that simplifying life in the form of creating a smartphone, for instance, is going to bring a higher quality of life. Well, we discovered that that wasn't true. <laughs> we assume that a longer honeymoon means we're going to enjoy it more. That is not true. We assume that going remotely, working remote, is going to make us happier. We've, it's not true. So are we starting to get the hang of this trap? that there actually is a trap in luxury. And a lot of us want to discover that for ourselves. And that makes sense. So I will just say from, from this side, and I, I heavily acknowledge that I am privileged to be able to say this, but there is a, there is some beauty, real beauty in simplicity. Whereas making more money comes with its own issues that often are more stressful. I just, in listening to that coming out of my mouth, I can already hear some of my listeners saying like, well, easy for you to say, Natalie. And like, I, I really freaking get it. So I just hope that as you hear this, we can hold that perspective that I've really encouraged people to hold for years, which is two things can be true. Two things can be true. There, there are certain, it's, it's a luxury to be able to take a, a month long honeymoon as opposed to a two month long or two, two week long honeymoon. It's a luxury. It's a privilege. That's true. And I want to question the idea that a month-long honeymoon is necessarily more satisfying than a two-week one. I hope that we can hold that. <laughs> it's like, yes, one month is more privileged than a two-week, but does that mean the person with the month-long honeymoon is necessarily more satisfied than the person with the two-week one? More does not mean better. So in a nutshell, when we were, when we were in honeymoon, we, we went on, we went to Australia to see the birds. Ever since I was five years old, I always studied parrots and birds. And I don't know what happened to me to trigger that. I guess I was just born with this deep, 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 deep love of birds. I liked cockatoos. I really liked parrots, Amazons. Not that I don't think Amazons are in Australia, at least not in where we were, but cockatoos, kookaburras, budgies, mm, rosellas, corellas, all these really cool birds. <laughs> and so many of them are in Australia. So when I was like five years old and looking through the Encyclopedia Britannica on cool parrots, I had like um, parakeets and a cockatiel and I always wanted a bigger bird, but I was either in college and roommates wouldn't allow it or my parents didn't want that level of commitment, which is not their fault. That makes sense. I don't even know if I want that commitment now. But I always really, really loved parrots and I follow so many bird accounts and so many people on Instagram send me bird videos all the time. And <laughs> I just want to let you know, I've, if, if you ever send me a bird video, I've probably seen it, but send it to me anyway, because I always feel so much love when people send me bird videos. So I, I, I love, I just love birds. But I noticed that a hard majority of my favorite birds were all in Australia. And over the 11 years of Preston and I being together, he has become a bird 
a birdie as well. He's become a bird fanatic as well. And so it's, it's really cute. He likes birds just as much as I do. And so we decided on honeymoon, we go to Australia, which is really, really freaking far. <laughs> we went really far away from California. So we had a, a little flight to Hawaii for a couple days. And then from Hawaii, we flew to Sydney. And we were so excited. We were thinking, oh my God, we've been looking at videos of these parrots. There's like a couple accounts we follow on Instagram, like the Almond Cafe, and it just shows videos of, of feeding king parrots and cockatoos. And we were thinking just like, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. And what we found was that there were a handful of moments, a handful of days throughout our honeymoon that were extraordinary. But for the most part, we were really stressed out. Long story short, it was a, it was very expensive for us. It was it was beyond what we had budgeted for, and yeah, just we we ended up not being able to kind of rest. We were staying in places that we could afford, which in Australia the cost of living is very high, kind of like Southern California. But when we were in Southern California, we were living with Preston's parents. And when we're not living with Preston's parents, we're living in Colombia, where the cost of living is very low. So all of a sudden, we were just paying for places a couple nights at a time because we were staying in Airbnbs and hotels. And we didn't want to stay in a, in a hostel. <laughs> I, mean, I recognize we could have, but we, uh, we live out of our suitcases. So we have like two suitcases each and hostel life was just, we didn't want to do that. So as a result... We were spending, just, just to exist, not even to eat out or do cool activities, just to exist, we were kind of, we were surprised by how much we were spending. We, we did not plan everything adva in advance. We figured we would figure it out as we go, which worked well in countries like Colombia or even Europe. But in Australia, it was, it was hefty for us. So there was that stress and we were both concerned about saving. And when we were doing experiences that were really incredible, there was still always in the back of the, our mind, like, oh, this is, we're going to have to figure out how to pay for this. And, you know, I, I both press and I have a much healthier relationship with money than we did in the past, but it was stressful. And it, it kind of positioned us to focus more on saving and, and not going beyond the budget that we both agreed to and less on enjoying each other and the relationship all for the sake of a month in Australia is better than two weeks. All the things we really wanted to do in Australia could have been done in two weeks. We burnt out after two weeks and we decided, okay, let's just chill and rest for the last two weeks. And um, we didn't really want to do anything. So we just stayed in, in studio apartments and I don't know, just scrolled. <laughs> so, And there was this, because it was such a long trip, I'm so glad we didn't do longer than a month. My goodness. Um, because it was such a long trip, in our opinion, um, we weren't able to set up routine. When you go on a vacation, if you're going for a week or two, you know that you'll be done in two weeks and you're going to go back to your routine. So it's, it's actually somewhat tolerable, in my opinion, that you'll be able to return to your routines. But we burned out in two weeks and we had two weeks to kill, <laughs> in a way. But those two weeks were really expensive. <laughs> in, in, in our eyes. So it was, it was costing a lot of money just to kill time. And, uh, and we'd gotten a bit sick of each other because we didn't have our grounding routines. We didn't have our hobbies and we really didn't want to break our budget and go do things like get massages all the time, which by the way, now that we're in Thailand, we're doing because it's like 20 bucks for a two hour massage. So I feel like our honeymoon has started now, now that we are here. I'm not focusing so much on building an empire like I was maybe a year ago because I want to I wanna have a baby and I'm trying to make my business simpler. I want to serve more people that maybe don't have the resources to work with me one-on-one. -on -one. So it's something that, that I'm thinking about, but it takes time to create these types of offerings that, that are more accessible. So I just, I just really want people to, to feel my heart in this. I'm, I'm thinking about you. And some people are maybe going to hear me saying, oh, our honeymoon was too expensive. And they're going to think, oh, it's easy for you to say. And other people are going to find this to be a relief to know that, yes, even though Natalie and Preston are in a really wonderful relationship and we're so grateful for one another, um, we spent a lot of the trip fighting. Not necessarily over money, because we were both on the same page around that. 
But because we, we were kind of suffocated by each other, we didn't have our friends around, we didn't have our social supports, um, because we could only really, because we were staying within our budget, the only thing we could afford inside that budget was studio apartments. Right now, usually when we stay someplace in Colombia, we have our own separate rooms where we can work and do our own stuff. But we were in a cramped, tiny little studio apartment Airbnbs in, in Australia. So we were just like with each other, in each other's faces all the time. Oh my God. And when you're out in the middle of the mountains, you know, we didn't have tango to go to. We didn't have, you guys hear me talk about maintaining separate lives a lot, right? And the importance of separateness in a relationship. I have talked about this countless times, but what happens when you're in a studio apartment and you're in the mountains without a social group, without hobbies? What do you do when you don't have the external context surrounding your relationship that allows you to have separate lives? So this makes me a lot more conscious of people who are experiencing relationship anxiety in a situation where having a separate life is not possible. It also makes me very sensitive to recognizing the effects of the pandemic, people who were kind of isolated with each other for long periods of time. No wonder there were so many divorces initiated during COVID. That makes total sense. So it's just something I'm thinking about. It's on my mind. If you don't have friends, if your partner doesn't have friends, if you don't have your own separate hobbies, your own separate passions, your own separate lives outside of the partnership, you start dumping all this pressure on your partner to make up for all those things. All of a sudden, I was things I would usually turn to my girlfriends for, I suddenly would hand off over to Preston. He'd be like, what the fuck? I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> and I would feel resentful for him not being able to meet me in that place. And he'd feel resentful for having to meet me in that place, right? And not even of his own free will. It would be like, I need this need met. And I it just, he couldn't, and vice versa. There were needs that he needed met that I just couldn't meet. And so it was tough, you guys. Make no mistake, there were so many moments. I made this beautiful reel on Instagram after I got back, or rather while I was at the park in Sydney, which is amazing, by the way. On my last day, I made this reel of all of our highlights. And that's it. just what they were, you guys. They were just highlights. And I had people saying, oh my God, your honeymoon looks so amazing. And it was, but just know that I only posted the good parts. It's not like I go live every time Press and I are in a stonewalling discussion. <laughs> you know, maybe I should do that. <laughs> but no, it's like, that's that's our those are our private matters. But when you only see the highlights, you think that that's the extent of our relationship. And it's just, it's just not. There were a lot of ordinary moments. There were a lot of dinners where I'm on my phone and he's on his phone. And we look like one of those couples that's not into each other, but like, we're going to be into each other later. A lot of moments where we're together, but we don't actually feel like being together in that moment. So we're kind of sick of each other in that moment. There were a lot of moments where I would feel overwhelmed and I'd say something critical and then he would shut down and then we'd have to repair like all the stuff that we dealt with in, in a weird way. We fought more on the honeymoon than we did not on the honeymoon. Like when we have our routines and our day-to-day -day things where I'm getting nourished and he's getting nourished and I have lots of things set in place so that I'm fed spiritually, emotionally, physically, when I don't have those things and I can't turn to those things, uh, yeah, it's, and, and Preston doesn't have his social support network, our relationship suffers. And if, if we don't recognize the greater context that our relationship sits inside, then we're going to think there's a problem with our compatibility. And sometimes it is, but in a lot of cases, it could just be that a lack of self-care for both people. I mean, just look at people who are in a wonderful relationship until they have kids, right? That throws a total wrench in their plan and self-care goes out the window and then we start having problems in the relationship. Not to say having kids will ruin your relationship, but it'll it'll change things and, and your priorities are going to have to shift. So, ah, <laughs> says the woman who wants to have kids. Anyway, in a nutshell, we had a beautiful time, but we had a lot of disconnection during the honeymoon, more disconnect than we have when we're not on honeymoon because of a lack of social support, a lack of alone time, a lack of self-care, a lack of routine and grounding activities, a lot of pressure to have an extraordinary experience all month long and anxiety around money. And not to mention, what's the honeymoon about? It's about transitioning into the next stage of your life. So we're thinking about kids and how we're going to provide for kids and la 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 la. The anxiety was high and oh, and we're not working. And working, by the way, I love Anxious Love Coach, but it can be a distraction. I can use Anxious Love Coach as a way to avoid thinking about things and feeling my feelings. And so 
sometimes go online and I post something and it feels super good and you guys are engaged and we're having so much fun and I can use it as a distraction from my life anxieties. All of a sudden I stopped working for a month and I had all this time to just think about things. Whew. <laughs> and when we're just sitting around we don't have our usual vices and you just have all this time to think about things. Yeah, anxiety comes up. <laughs> So I, I just wanted to to say that our our honeymoon was beautiful and I am so glad we're done. Two things are true. And I I want to talk a little bit too about the whole dynamic of a vacation is there's this constant the extraordinary experiences that we're striving for. We're trying to avoid the ordinary. We're doing something different. But it's it's weird on your nervous system if you think about it. And like I said in the beginning, the extraordinary moments on a vacation become normal and something to strive for, and the ordinary moments become lows and something to avoid. And there was a, po a point where Press and I were at this really nice eco-resort type thing for, for birds. It's called O'Reilly's, which, by the way, was awesome. We loved it there. We liked feeding the king parrots and rosellas. But we were there for five days, and there were no gym for Preston and Preston's gym is like his freaking church. Like he loves working out. And I didn't have tango or Pilates, which right now Pilates is my thing. I'm very into reformers, but I didn't have those things. It's not like O'Reilly's has a Pilates studio. <laughs> it's not like there's a tango milonga in the middle of the forest. So neither of us had access to our typical grounding things. But yes, of course, the birds are amazing. Of course, this is awesome. We were fighting. We were feeling suffocated and out of our element. We didn't know anybody there. We fell out of our comfort zone. Our only friends were really the birds. And during that time, I had something to say, but as you know, I was off Instagram, so I wasn't posting. So what I did is I pulled out my notes app and I wrote this thing. I, I committed to sharing it later. I did. I actually sent out an email with this note kind of midway through my... Uh, my honeymoon. So if you were, if you're on my email list, you, you might've gotten it. If you're not on my email list, definitely get on it. Cause sometimes I, sometimes I share little nuggets that, uh, that I just want to send in a written form. And it's, it's longer, it's a longer love note than I can fit into an Instagram post. So I send it on email, but if you didn't get my email, that's fine. By the way, if you want, if you want to join my email list, you can do so on my website, scroll down to the bottom. So here is that note that I wrote to myself but ultimately, I'm, I'm giving it to you as well. So here we go. This is the note that I wrote on my honeymoon. Here's the thing. You want the honeymoon to be great. Of course you do. Why wouldn't you? But this wanting puts so much pressure on it to be spectacular. You only get one honeymoon if you do it right, right? So if this is the one honeymoon, it had better be awesome because you want to do life with this person. So this is it. Get it right. But on your honeymoon, it's likely that you'll be plonking yourself out of your routine. You'll be away from your family and friends and hobbies and silly little comforts. If you stepped away from your work, the silly little comforts of your work are gone too. Nope, none of that is available. Just your husband, who has suddenly become extra annoying, human, inconvenient, hairy, and smelly. Is this who I married? But you're doing all these amazing things, seeing all these amazing sights, eating this amazing food, getting the VIP treatment. My goodness, shame on you. People would kill to be in your position. Why did all those people even bother pitching in for your beautiful vacation just for you to scowl and bicker with your husband? You ungrateful son of a bitch. And yet, these moments wear off like any other spectacular new thing, one right after the other, and suddenly you're chasing the highs, and what were once normals become lows, and you want to avoid those. Because the last thing you want on your honeymoon is ordinariness. We can enjoy ordinary back home. Why strive for ordinary on your honeymoon? But see, you're still you. Your flawed husband is still your flawed husband. You're still the same old farts, just in fancy pants and fancy hotels, drinking fancy drinks. If anything, you're now riding the roller coaster of high expectations and disappointment. 
Perhaps the freedom is actually in embracing the ordinary along with the extraordinary. And just like in your off honeymoon life, cultivate your own things, your own moments, your own connections. And just like in your off honeymoon life, you will feel moments of irritation and disconnection. A honeymoon isn't an escape from difficult feelings. Your honeymoon doesn't always have to be about just you two, because your relationship isn't the only thing that's changing. A honeymoon can also be about who you, individually, are becoming. It's worth taking time in solitude to contemplate and celebrate this new phase in your life, to remember who you are, who you've always been, and who you always will be, beyond marriage, partnership, and the external life you'll be creating together. So perhaps if we were to allow ourselves to spend the entire day in our hotel room eating chips alone and reading a comic book, even though there is absolutely stuff to do nearby on vacation that you couldn't do. So perhaps if we were to allow ourselves to spend the entire day in our hotel rooms alone, eating chips and reading a comic book, even though there is absolutely stuff to do nearby on vacation that you couldn't do anywhere else, and yes, you chose not to do that anyway, oh, the delicious rebellion of enjoying life on your own terms. Then maybe, just maybe, we would actually enjoy our beautiful honeymoons as the extraordinary, ordinary getaways that they were meant to be. Getaways from everything but ourselves. And that is my note. So I hope that that note spoke for itself. I'm not going to add too much for that. A brief couple of announcements. I mentioned this in my recent podcast, which if you haven't listened to it, my guess is if you're listening to this, you probably listened to that one. But the one I just did on breaking free from relationship anxiety, my story revisited, which please listen to that one, especially if you're an avid listener. It's my story, but with a lot of context that has arisen since I recorded my very first podcast episode. Really important. But I wanted to mention that I have a retreat with my teacher, my meditation teacher, Steffi Price. A lot of the techniques that I embodiment and meditation and mindfulness techniques, which I have all my yoga and meditation training, but a lot of the trauma-informed techniques that I learned were from my teacher, Steffi Price, in Austria. It's where I had my big breakthrough with anxiety. But it's coming full circle, and Steffi and I are actually co-hosting two retreats this summer slash fall on the inner relationship, the relationship you have with, with yourself. So you don't have to have relationship anxiety to come. It's, it's, a, it's a retreat that will support anyone who finds themselves with internal splits where you have one part that wants one thing in your life and another part that wants another thing and they're kind of at a standstill and you're finding yourself being very stagnant. That is a split with your inner relationship. So if that's something that you're interested in, by the way, relationship anxiety falls under this split. So if you struggle with relationship anxiety, it will help you with that, even though this is not a relationship anxiety retreat. But Steffi Price and I are both going to be hosting it at her home in Austria. Um, it's worth noting that this is a very small scale retreat. I'm only marketing it to people who listen to me talk for a long time on my podcast because I want people who are invested and people who trust me. Um, because I actually have not made like a formal sales page. It's literally just word of mouth. June is like, we have a June one and a September one. The June one is like completely sold out. I have one spot. It was sold out, but one spot opened up. So feel free to email me if you want to jump on that. And I think we have like two or three spots in September. So if you want to grab these spots, please email me. My email is natalie at anxiouslovecoach.com. And I'll send you the details. Um, It's a really easy train ride from Vienna. Steffi will pick you up. It's going to be super cozy. And if, like I said, you're struggling with internal splits and you're finding yourself exhausted (laughs) and not able to move forward in your life because two parts of you can't get on the same page, this will help you with that. Um, So just email me, natalie at anxiouslovecoach.com. I will email you all the details of the retreat, um, what it's entailed, the time, the pricing, all of these things. I will say this is probably the least expensive retreat I have ever hosted and maybe ever will host um, simply because it's at Steffi's house and it's not a retreat like venue. I don't have to pay overhead fees like like I usually do. So take advantage of it. 
You're welcome to bring a partner, but just know that this is not a couple's retreat. What else was I going to say? Yeah, stay in your own process. It'll be really, it'll be really beautiful. Austria is really gorgeous. One of my favorite places in the world. There's that. I also wanted to let you know, because this happens on, on Instagram, it happens on TikTok, it happens in my email, and it's so beautiful. I love getting emails from you guys. I just want you to know that I love emails. However, I don't always respond. And especially if you have like a complex life situation or, you know, you really want someone to fully understand the complexity of your situation, I get a lot of emails. I try to read through all of them, but I don't always respond. However, if you are wanting a response and you want to guarantee that, I have this service and I don't talk about it very often, but it's a, it's a really, really cool service. It's called a Wizio. And Essentially, if you have a question, you can go to wizio.com, W-I-S-I-O.com slash anxious love coach. Um, I'll put a link in this episode as well. And you can ask me a question with, you can type me a long paragraph and, or you can send me a voice note and I will make a thoughtful, customized seven to 10 minute video with my thoughts on your situation take it with a grain of salt. A lot of times, you know, there's, it's not like it's a therapy session where I can do a whole intake and and know everything. So I'm always going to be missing nuance and context, but my heart's totally in it. I have, I, I think I have pretty good reviews on this. You can just use it as a, as a second opinion on your situation. I'll do my best to, to share what, what I see and what I might be sensing and some options of, of what you could do to improve your situation. For this type of service, because it is so custom, it's at the moment, it's $67. Yeah. So it's a really cool thing. It's a good way to work with me one-on-one without working with me one-on-one because working with me one-on-one, it's, it's a whole thing. It requires a lot of energy. I, I do right now when I take on a one-on-one client, it funds a lot of my free content. So when I take like three one-on-one clients, they're in a sense, buying me the freedom to serve the masses for free and make podcasts and and Instagrams and TikToks and send out emails. Yeah, of course I get a lot of chunks from from courses, but my one-on-ones kind of allow me to to serve the masses. But like I said earlier in the podcast, I'm I'm brainstorming ways to to be more accessible cuz that's really important to me. So one of the things we might be doing sometime in the future, I might be getting some sponsorships. I'm definitely thinking very carefully about this because I don't just want a bunch of ads in my podcast, but this podcast is big enough to where we can start thinking about sponsorships and, and I can, what's really cool. And maybe if you, if you don't, if you're not a content creator, it's worth knowing like what it's like on this side. One of the things about having a sponsor for my podcast means that I can make money from the podcast and I can actually put out lower cost offerings, which would be really cool. So we might have say like a Patreon, which is like $30 a month. And then I can set up like a, um, a whole group where people can come and ask questions with me personally. If I were to have ads on my podcast, I might be able to do something like that that would allow me to be more accessible. Those are the kind of things I'm thinking about. If you know of brands, like if you listen to podcasts and you hear certain products being marketed and and you like them, please let me know because I might reach out to them to sponsor us as well. And in a cool way, yes, ads will will definitely benefit me financially. But I also want you to think about like how that could benefit you. Because if I'm getting taken care of doing podcasts, that means I am free to offer more low-cost resources to people. I really would love for it to be a win-win. So just, just some thoughts. With that said, I am taking one-on-ones right now. So if you go to anxiouslovecoach.com, you will find the option to work with me one-on-one over the course of three months. If that's something you're interested in, please feel free to submit a request for an assessment. I'll take a look at it. And and if I think we can potentially proceed, then we'll set up a call. Or you can submit a Wizio or just keep listening to this podcast that I love making so much for you. I hope you enjoy this episode. All right, everybody. (laughs) I hope you have a beautiful day. Thanks for tuning in today. And I will chat with you in the next episode. Thanks so much for listening to the Anxious Love Coach today. If you loved this episode, please hit that subscribe button, leave a review, and follow me on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. 
and maybe share it with someone that you believe might benefit from these perspectives. Please also subscribe to my email list at www.anxiouslovecoach.com as I'm trying to reduce my reliance on social media. In exchange, you will receive my free relationship anxiety meditation and more supportive tools sent your way. If you would like to work with me, head on over to my website at, again, anxiouslovecoach.com to explore different tiers of coaching options and online programs. Thanks again for listening and catch you in the next episode. Have a blessed day.